I know we were supposed to start with that placement exam here, but I didn't get everything ready. So we'll do it probably in class tomorrow instead. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to do the first lecture on physics here to begin, and then we'll take a little break and then we'll just do the lab. I have to start with the solar eclipse stuff that I want to explain better yesterday. Did you guys enjoy the solar eclipse? Yeah. I thought it was pretty awesome. It's the first time I've seen a total solar eclipse. So it was, you know, pretty special for me. I'm not enough of a nerd to go traveling around everywhere. Although seven years in April, we can all head to the next one. It's going to pass from Texas to Maine. So got to be on that path. But why do we have solar eclipses? What's the simple answer of what causes a solar eclipse? Okay, the moon is between us and the sun. And so the shadow cast by the moon hits the earth. It's something we understand pretty well as long as we believe as long as we believe that the earth is actually a globe and it's going around the sun there i belong to some creationist groups on facebook and there are some people who are just adamant that the world is flat and i don't know how they would explain the eclipses and how we can exactly predict when they're going to come when they hold on to that belief but anyway so we have to have the moon between the sun and the earth what phase is the moon if it's between the – well, here's another thing flat earthers don't believe. They don't believe that the moon is dark and that we see light reflected off of the – you know, from sun to moon to us. But that's really what makes the moon light up. It's light reflected from the sun. So if the moon is between us and the sun, what do we see reflected off of the moon? Do we see the entire thing reflecting light, none of it, or somewhere in between? It's actually going to be none. In this geometry, you're going to have the sun here. You notice, I don't care that the answer wasn't correct. I care that somebody thought and expressed. We have the sun, we have the moon, and we have the earth. Now, of course, my sizes and scales are really out of whack. It's not my issue here. But the sun will be lighting up that portion of the moon. The other portion doesn't see the sunlight because it's blocked by the moon. And so if we're on Earth, so we're standing here, we see the side of the moon that the sun is not hitting. And so that's what we call a new moon. It's dark. So anytime you have an eclipse, it has to be a new moon. Now, I know I asked yesterday who had seen Apocalypto. It was only one person. In Apocalypto, they do the funny thing of it's a solar eclipse, and then that night it's a full moon, which is two weeks after. But, you know, that's, that's movies for you. So it's a new moon when we have a solar eclipse. We have new moons every 29 days, roughly. So why don't we have a solar eclipse every 29 days? Would it be because of the location of the moon? Yes, that could be it, Erika. Erika. I've been working on her name, Erika Viegas Perez, or something to that effect. <laughs> okay, so she she hit she hit the answer perfectly. We have the plane that the Earth is going around the Sun. We call that the ecliptic, and the Moon is going around the Earth, but the plane of the moon's orbit around the earth is tilted by about five degrees so this blue light blue and dark blue is supposed to show you an angle there of about five degrees between the plane the moon is going around the earth and the plane the earth is going around the sun so that means when the moon is quote between the earth and sun most of the time it's actually a little bit above or a little bit below the earth Hence, its shadow comes out here, but it passes above or below the Earth, no eclipse. We have to be on what we call the line of nodes, which is shown here, this dash. Okay, let me not do that. This dashed line here is called the line of nodes. We have to be in that part of the orbit for us to have the chance of an eclipse. And that applies to both a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse. A lunar eclipse is where the Earth's shadow strikes the moon. The Earth's shadow is really big compared to the moon. So if it's nighttime, you see the lunar eclipse, and those happen you know, quite regularly. 
you typically will see a lunar eclipse at least one a year is possible for you to see from your home. Uh, <clears throat> solar eclipses, in theory, should happen somewhere on Earth approximately twice a year. But in practice, sometimes the moon is a little closer than normal and we have a nice good eclipse like we had yesterday. Sometimes it's a little farther than normal and we have what we call an annular eclipse. In 2012, we had an annular eclipse where the moon passed in front of the sun, but you could still see a ring of the sun around the moon. So on average, a solar eclipse you know, should happen approximately twice a year. In reality, a total eclipse, there were like 18 in the 25 year period shown here. I didn't count them. I, well, I did count them, but not today. So we looked at this and then one last thing, just talking about this and then I'm gonna explain why I'm talking about it. If you look at this, do you see any eclipse lines that look very similar, just offset a little from each other? And the answer should be yes. And then I'm going to ask you where. Okay. You said corner of the equator? No, point along the equator. Um, okay, so the equator is, I believe, right here. Okay, so this one here, this is the one that's going to happen in seven years. And then this one here. Now, notice the times. 2006 and 2024, March and April. As we understand the eclipses, we have the two sequences going on. We have the moon orbiting around the Earth, and we have the Earth orbiting around the sun. And by taking those orbits, we can calculate how long it's going to be for the geometry to reoccur. And it turns out that it reoccurs every 18 years, 10 or 11 days, depending on where we are in the leap year cycle, and 8 hours. So the same geometry reoccurs at that period. So if you look at this, March 29, 2016, if you add, I didn't pay attention to the number of leap years, 10 or 11 days, you will get to April 8 and then 18 years, 2024. So those are the same geometry. It's repeating. We call that repeating cycle the sorrow cycle after the person who identified it. Um, that's an O, the second letter, or second one. So the one we just had, don't see a, a twin to that one, and you shouldn't because it only goes 2001 to 2025. If you subtract 18 from 2017, it's 1999. So that one is not doubled. This one here and this one here. November 2003, December 2021, those are the same eclipse. And I had identified, yeah, this one here. June 21, 2001, July 2, 2019 are the same eclipse. Here's another one, December 2, 2004, December 14, 2020. Right, so these are very well understood. Now, why am I talking about this in physics class? <laughs> because it's awesome. I mean, it is because it's awesome, but it's also. Go ahead, Erica. Would it be because of uh, the light reflecting to Earth and then the way like, the angles it has to work? Okay. Talking about light, light is the thing we study in physics, the angles it has to go through refractions type of thing. Um, more specifically, Alex. <laughs> More, more specifically, all of this, doing the calculations, observing that the eclipses seem to repeat over time, that's all physics, right? The seeing something interesting, hey, this eclipse, and this eclipse that occurred 54 years later, three sorrow cycles later, should reoccur in the same place, they were like exactly the same. Why? You have that observation of something interesting and then trying to explain why and coming up with answers. And so we now understand everything based on orbital mechanics. We have the force of gravity that is holding the moon to the Earth, the force of gravity holding the Earth to the sun, and the orbits that result because of those 
all of these things come together to help us be able to explain this using physics. And so that's why I bring it up because it's a good practical example of physics that we just saw cool effects of what God's done in nature yesterday. Our textbook, if you're in physics 151, <laughs> this is the theoretical cover of your textbook. If you actually purchase a hard bound one for $40 or so, that's what it's going to look like. This is what it used to look like when it was normally printed and cost, you know, a couple hundred dollars instead of $40. If you are in the physics 251 class, they used green on green for the background, blue for the foreground looks otherwise the same. It says university instead of college. So looking at what physicists do, I talked about this a little bit. We're studying the physical universe. We're studying the things that are around us and how we interact with them, trying to explain why things happen. You guys probably would assume, and rightly so, that I believe that God created the universe. And so I believe, much like you know, Sir Isaac Newton, that I am studying God when I am studying the physics. But we have a tendency as humans to look at this, and the more we learn about physics, the more we can explain things. And so in the Bible, we have the story of the flood. And after the flood, you know, God put a rainbow in the sky and said, I do send, you know, the rainbow will be a sign between me and you that I'll never send a flood again. And ever since then, people, the Jews, and later on the Christians, have believed, you know, that the rainbow is a sign of this promise made by God. But then scientists have come along and scientists can explain exactly what makes a rainbow. A rainbow is caused by having little droplets of water and you have sunlight that comes and hits the droplet of water. That's not where I wanted to make it actually. And it refracts once, reflects once, refracts a second time. And even though sunlight, that did not change the color, there we go. Sunlight contains all the colors of the rainbow. See, I think that's right. When they're refracted, different colors are refracted by different angles. I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about which colors refracted more. So if I have it backward, yeah, don't sue me. Um, <laughs> and so we have the light dispersed or spread out. And so the rainbow occurs at a very specific angle looking you know, from the sun to the water droplets to you. And we can explain exactly what makes it. And so scientists then go ahead and say, okay, back then they were superstitious. They didn't understand how anything worked. And so they said, our God did it. But now we understand and we don't have a need for God. And so there's a lot of today's scientists that say, we're studying and learning about how the universe works and in the process, we're refuting God. Now, I don't believe that, but those are two views about it. I always go to David who you know, says, be not wise in thine own eyes. Lean not unto thine understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. Anyway, that's what we're trying to do in science. We're trying to understand our world. And as a Christian, I believe that it's helping me to understand more about the intricacy of God's design. Some examples of where we see physics in action. You know, you heat up your food using microwaves. I have family members who believe you damage your food with microwaves. Just so we're really clear about the physics of what's going on. Microwaves are electromagnetic waves. We use them all the time. Every time you, you know, use your cell phone, you're beaming microwaves. When you put that against your head, you're beaming microwaves right through your head. Um, is it damaging you? Only a little bit. <laughs> Only a little bit. The, the science is not 100% clear on this. Um, most studies have shown that there's absolutely no problem. The energy associated with microwaves is not high enough to have a microwave um, cause damage. But what they do do is they cause water molecules to vibrate. And if you cause enough vibration, you're putting in energy, it gets hotter. And that's how you cook food. You're making the water molecules vibrate and that transfers energy into the food out of the way of getting it hotter and cooking. And so in theory, you could be doing a little bit of cooking of your brain. And indeed, one research study where they took 
cell phones. Some of them were turned on, some were turned off. The people couldn't tell. And they just attached them to their heads for a day. And they studied blood flow and they found the people with the cell phones that were turned on had higher blood flow on the side of their head where the cell phone was. Scary, right? Yeah. Except for the difference was smaller than the difference between you sitting now and if you were to stand up. Right. So it was a very minute difference, but it was measurable. OK, so that's using physics. GPS, we have a whole constellation of satellites up there that have clocks on them that send out signals that say, beep, the time is you know, 10, 27 and 32 seconds. Beep. And then on your little cell phone, you have a receiver that's receiving all of these radio signals from the satellites. And it takes the times that they say and calculates the distance based on the actual time and the time that the satellite said it was. And when it gets the distance from the different satellites, it knows where the satellites are because of our orbital understanding, our understanding of the orbits of the satellites. We can predict exactly where they'll be. But it's even more complicated than that because of relativity, a clock in a satellite doesn't keep the same time as a clock on Earth. And so they have to make these clocks so on Earth they don't keep correct time. So when they put them up in, in orbit, they'll keep correct time. You know, so it's actually really complicated just the physics going on for the GPS system. What's going on with these birds? See, I'm really good at biology. I know those are birds. <laughs> Why would that be here? Migration. Okay. They are using things to figure out where they're going. And we try to understand that. And as we understand it, I believe birds actually migrate using the magnetic fields of the earth. Bees, on the other hand, use polarization of sunlight, which is so awesome. Um, also, there is the way that the birds can fly. You know, their wing shape makes a big difference. And so we've learned a lot of physics by looking at these. And once again, I believe God created these things so that they could fly. And we're learning from God's creation so that we could make airplanes. Um, MRI of the head. And <laughs> this here is clearly something in biology. What I know about a cytoplasm is that I can read the name. <laughs> but the control of everything in here fundamentally relies on physics. And so that's why you have classes that are biophysics, the physics that, you know, makes biology work. Chemistry is advanced quantum mechanics. When I was in graduate school, we had a quantum mechanics class that was a senior college class slash first year graduate school. We, they made us take it because they figured we didn't have enough quantum mechanics. But for the chemistry students, it was their toughest course. It was their weed out course. If you could get through that class, then you could get the chemistry. We all laughed because, you know, our remediation class was their weed out course because we have that kind of self-opinion. Now, as we study physics, we're going to learn some words. And there's some words that we use in everyday life, like work. Everybody knows the word work and you know, has an idea. I go to work. I earn some money. In physics, we're going to talk about work, and we're going to have a very specific meaning. So some words we're going to use you're familiar with, but not familiar with the specific meaning we're going to use in physics. Other words you may not be familiar with at all. So as we go along, I'm going to try to be careful to identify words and define them so you know what we mean when we use them in physics class. So here's an example. Speed versus velocity. Speed, well, that's the rate at which something's traveling, right? Distance divided by time, how fast it's going. Velocity is the speed and the direction. So if you're going 55 miles an hour, that's a speed. If you're going 55 miles an hour north, that's a velocity. Unfortunately, I myself make the mistake of exchanging those words. I mean, I've since long before you were born, I've been using these words. But still, I get confused, especially because we write symbols and we write V for speed. And we write V with an arrow over it for velocity. Well, as I'm writing down and I write V, my brain just says velocity, even if I don't put the arrow over it to make it velocity. That's, I think, the biggest reason why I make that mistake. So those two words have specific meanings. And if we say velocity, we mean we have the direction with the speed. So it's a distinction there. 
Another one that a lot of people make mistakes on and we go into holy wars about is mass versus weight. Mass and weight are completely different. The units of mass in the SI system, we use the kilograms. The unit of weight in the SI system, we use the newton. What do we use for weight in the imperial system? We use the pound. Does anyone have any clue what we use for mass in the imperial system? I'm going to go with the one who's not Alex. Is that the slug? The slug, that's right. Most people have no idea what a slug is. A slug is a unit of mass in the imperial system. Mass is a measurement of how much matter is present. In fact, there's two definitions for mass, if you care to know. One is the gravitational mass. It tells us about how strongly something interacts with the gravitational force. One is the inertial mass, it tells us how hard it will be to stop something that's moving. And so they're actually different definitions, but as far as any experiment has been able to determine, they're the same thing. So mass, we're gonna just use the SI units. So we're gonna use mass in units of kilograms, and that's how much stuff is present. The weight is a force and so we have units of newtons, which I'll define later. A force is anything that pushes or pulls. And so as I stand in front of you, gravity is a force acting on me, pushing me down. And my weight is how strong that force is. If I were to move from here to, let's say, the moon, Let's say it's instant, you know, sky beam. Well, sky beam, yeah, but I guess they're different atoms, but so that's not good. But if I could instantly move from here to the moon, I would have the same number of atoms. And hence, the amount of matter that makes me up would be the same. So I'd have the same mass. My mass of kilograms would be exactly the same here as on the moon. But if I were to stand on a scale on the moon, would it be the same as it is here? No, it'd be like one sixth. So I would lose an enormous amount of weight. It's kind of like my life's dream. <laughs> but I wouldn't be any skinnier, right? Mass is the measurement of how much stuff is present. That's what I really need to lose. I don't need to lose weight. I can do that by, you know, move to Denver. I'll probably lose a quarter of a pound just because there's smaller gravitational force there. It's the mass I need to move, lose. Now, what makes this difficult is we often have scales. A scale is measuring the force, but it says kilograms. What's going on there is they are using, well, the acceleration of gravity is pretty constant on the surface of the Earth. So if it weighs this much, we can calculate its mass in kilograms. And people start thinking that's the same thing, that mass in kilograms and weight, and, well, you think of it in pounds probably, they're equivalent and they're not. Like I said, you, it's kind of like a holy war and you can see I care, I care way too much about it. In physics, we work with things of varying sizes. This here, those are individual atoms that have been moved on a surface to spell out IBM. It's a very iconic, they used a, uh, I think it was a um, atomic force microscope to move the pieces and then take a picture. It might have been a, yeah, it's got to be an atomic force microscope. And then, of course, the universe, we study that. So in physics, we're studying all kinds of size scales. In this class, most of what we'll be doing is on the sizes that we deal with. Now, in class earlier today, the calculus class, I had made a mistake and I asked the students if they could see the mistake I made. It was an honest mistake. I wasn't making a mistake on purpose, sadly. Um, and a student said, it doesn't have units. And that units thing is a very important idea. Now, I, it wasn't the key I was looking for in that case. But if I tell you, you know, you have this example, a guy's looking at a map that says it's this many cables. You're like, well, how far is that? I don't know. You know, we have to have units to tell us about something. So we use, for time, our standard unit is second. But of course, if I give you my age, my age is 50. That's not 50 seconds, it's 50 years. You would have guessed that, right? You would have said, well, clearly he's not 50 seconds old. I can tell the difference in a you know, less than one minute old baby, and an old gray haired dude. But for many things, it's not so clear. You know, if I tell you that uh, that a certain city 
is 500 away, you wouldn't know if that's 500 kilometers or 500 miles, but it's a big difference between 500 kilometers and 500 miles. So we need to have the units with our things in physics. So for instance, on tests, on laboratory work, you need to have units with numbers, not just the number. If you say the mass is 27.37 and you don't give the units, you'll lose points because that's an important part of telling us what's going on. So the standard units for time is seconds. And I have here some history since 1967. I turned one in 1967. Um, translation, I was born before the second was identified as is today or defined as today. One second has been the time for 9,192,631,770 cycles of a hyperfine transition in cesium when it's at rest at 0k. Okay, the, the last two things are making it a little more defined. Um, that's the definition of a second. Now, that's pretty, uh, pretty exact. Why do you suppose we have a bizarre definition of a second like that? Precise. Okay, it's precise, but what's really important is, and it has to be precise, right? what's really important is anywhere in the world you can make this measurement. So you can determine what a second is anywhere in the world. As long as you have that definition, you have access to the right equipment, you can determine what a second is. And that's the goal for our units, to try to have something that can be reproduced anywhere so you don't have to like try to guess that. You know, you don't take a thing of sand, tip it over and say, okay, when this is done, that's been 100 seconds, right? Because no one else can reproduce that unless they get your sand and so that's our definition of what a second is. And we, we have these other units that you're very familiar with. I, I skipped putting in fortnights, but you know. Other units of time, the standard distance. The standard distance is a meter. If you go back in time, historically, we had things like a foot. How long is a foot? It's roughly that long. It depended on who the king was, how long the foot was. And as I understand things, the foot was the length of the king's foot, yard was the distance from the king's nose to his outstretched fingers. You know, they had these bizarre units of measurement that were absolutely not reproducible and would change whenever the, the king did. And so I don't know when the original meter was actually defined, but they defined it as one ten millionth of the distance from the North Pole to the equator along the prime meridian. Now, at the time they did this, no one had even been to the North Pole. They did calculations, and they came up with the distance for the meter, and they marked that distance on a platinum iridium bar. And then they took that platinum iridium bar, they put it in double vacuum chamber, it's put a chamber around it and evacuate it, put a chamber around that and evacuate it. And then they store it, and if anybody wants to check the meter, they would have to come and <laughs> take it out and you know, compare. Well, that's, once again, not very easy to reproduce. So in 1983, that would be a year before I graduated from high school, it was redefined as the distance light travels in 1, 299 million, 792,458 of a second. In vacuum, yes. In, in vacuum is important. This is, once again, very precise. It's actually exact. It's defined as exactly that. As God is my witness, if I had been the one who made the decision, that number would have just been 300 million. No one would have noticed this slight difference, right? Because, I mean, you're only different by basically two in the fourth place. And it would have been really easy. But nobody asked me. I was still in high school. And so we have this definition of what a meter is that, once again, can be reproduced anywhere in the world. So we have the time can be reproduced anywhere in the world. The meter can be reproduced anywhere in the world. Um, I'll actually go one step further on you. It's actually the speed of light and vacuum that is the definition. The speed of light and vacuum is exactly 299792458 meters per second. 
and then a meter is the uh, defined by that. So if somebody does a more precise measurement on the speed of light, they actually will be changing the length of a meter. Kind of bizarre to know, right? You guys are just not as thrilled about these things. <laughs> now we get to mass. I know, you're not kind of devoted your life to state physics. Mass, that's the standard mass. That plug is one kilogram. We still have no better mass definition than whatever that thing is, is one kilogram. And so scientists are busily scratching their head, trying to figure out how they can make a reproducible mass. But that's where we stand. You can see here it's in two vacuum chambers. There's one vacuum chamber there, bell jar, and then, of course, the outer one. And recent experiments suggest, suggest that the mass of that thing in the double vacuum is slowly changing with time, and everyone's really baffled. <laughs> Once again, we just need a better definition of, of the standard mass so we can understand what's going on better. Okay, the units we use, the base units of everything that we'll be using this semester pretty much are meters, kilograms, and seconds. The mass is in kilograms. It's unique because it has that prefix kilo. Kilo means thousand. So the standard unit of mass is a thousand grams. The standard unit of time is one second. The standard unit of distance is one meter. And this is called the System International, or International, oh, Dionetus or the International System of Units. So it's SI for the French. Or, <laughs> this is what I've always learned, the metric system. Now, none of you guys were alive when the U.S. officially changed the metric system. But I was. I was like in second grade, maybe third grade. And they changed all the road signs. So they had miles per hour, and then they had kilometers per hour. And the distances had kilometers and miles. Do you guys know that? Yeah, they did. And of course, I was a little grade schooler. I was confused just like everyone else. Well, my fellow Americans made us all proud just like they did in the most recent elections and everything else going on. <laughs> and they said, this is too confusing. I can't handle it. And so they had spent millions of dollars changing all these road signs. And they said, millions of dollars changing them back because the Americans were confused. And so physicists are kind of out here on our own, well, scientists on our own, using the units the rest of the world does that make more sense. Why do these units tend to make more sense, in my opinion? I know, I'm asking you to read my mind, but let's see if you can come up with my reasons. Yeah? Because they're all base 10. Because they're base 10. We don't have silly things like, well, there's 16 ounces in a pound. All, all I know is I was a half an ounce less than 10 pounds at birth. And so... It must be 15 and a half if it's 16. But there's, there's like 12 ounces in something else, right? Like in a cup or something? It, it confuses me to... Okay. I, I get those all confused. But with the metric system, it's all just tens. We use prefixes. And so you're going to need to know some of these prefixes. Um, these are the standard units. This is, I believe, all of them. Like I said, these are the ones we're going to be using this semester. Oh, we'll also use Kelvin's. We'll also use that one. So those are the units we'll be using this semester. Next semester, we'll add in those two. Everything else is going to be a derived unit. So we talk about units of force. Force is a derived unit. A newton is made up of kilograms, meters, and seconds. And I'll introduce these as we go along. But you should know the fundamental units for those three things. And the prefixes, oh goodness, where do I have prefixes? I'm trying to get right to it. I'm skipping all of that. Let, nobody has the clickers. Is, have people, I mean, I'm, I don't even have the clicker set up. So when I say nobody has, I'm assuming you're not right. Um, I will try to use clickers for class tomorrow. If you don't have them registered yet, you know, talk to me. We'll try to work things out. Just looking at this, this is kind of like a logic question. If people don't do well on this, I'll go back to the previous slides. And I know my slide has a problem here. Suppose the ABC, yeah, I'm just book center. <laughs> if you're in Hawaii, it means a whole different store. Has Bibles that normally cost $20 on a 50% off sale. You have a coupon to take 50% off of any sale price. 
what's the price for a Bible with the sale and coupon combined? Okay, so we're not we don't have our clickers handy. So what would it be? Okay, um, James. Oh, five dollars. Five dollars. Five dollars. How did you get five dollars? Perfect. Is that what the rest you have? Mm -hmm. Now I know plenty of people who would have said free, free, free. Because I took off 50 and then I took off 50. 50 plus 50 is 100. <laughs> but that's not the way this works, sadly. Um, another sad thing, you know, I have stock. If the stock loses 50% one day and it gains 50% the second day, how am I doing? I'm down 25% because it loses 50%. Let's say it was $100, lose 50%. The next day it's $50. Gains 50%, half of 50 is 25. So it gains 25. I'm still down 25. Now, they, these things can be annoying when you, you look at the stock and say it went down and went up the same amount. Nope. Okay. Um, I thought I had the prefixes here. I'm sure I'll come to them, so I'm not going to define them right now. When we get to them, I'll just go over the prefixes. Some history of science. If you go back to Aristotle, and not just Aristotle, but ancient Greeks, we have lots of physics that was done back then. Things like, what shape did I say the Earth is? Round. When was that discovered? There, there is great misinformation on this. That's why I'm asking the question. Christopher Columbus. Yeah, a lot of people believe it has to do with Christopher Columbus. That he convinced Queen Isabella that the Earth was a sphere, and so you could get to India faster if you went the other direction around the globe. That's untrue. That is an artifact from a book that was written in the 1800s. It was known back before Aristotle. Not just that the Earth was a sphere, but what the radius of the Earth was. And Christopher Columbus thought that these ancient Greeks were wrong in the radius of the Earth, that the Earth was actually a smaller radius than it really is. And that's what, you know, he thought it would be quicker to go the other direction because he thought the Earth was smaller. Not because he said, oh, it's a sphere, it's not flat. So they learned a lot of things that we tend to think are more recent. The idea that the Earth is orbiting around the sun was an idea that was posited well before the birth of Christ. You know, so they did a lot of great work. Um, Aristotle came up with a theory that said that the Earth was the center of the universe and all of the planets were traveling around on crystal spheres. Why? Why, Why spheres? Because Aristotle thought a sphere was the perfect geometric shape. Why crystal? Because he thought crystal was the perfect material. And when he said crystal, he didn't mean crystal like iron crystal. He meant like um, quartz crystal. But So he had these ideas, and they were not based on actual scientific measurement and observation. They were based on what seemed really beautiful. Their theory, their theory was a theory. <laughs> the idea was if a theory was beautiful, then it must be true. And so... That theory of Aristotle's about the earth being the center and everything going around it was the dominant theory for about 2,000 years. But then we had Galileo Galilei. I just love saying both of his names. Um, of course, that's, I think, in English. Here is, here is his name probably in his native, and that just looks like the same thing twice. It's not really as fun. Um, Galileo decided that really we need to test things. And so he, he believed in the, hey, thanks. Yes, I loaned him a textbook. Um, Galileo believed we need to be testing things, and he believed that Copernicus, who had repopularized the idea of a heliocentric system, that the planets are going around the sun, was correct. And so he did some observations. He used a telescope to look at the sun. How many people looked at the sun through our telescope yesterday? Really? <laughs> the person who was manning it and one other. I, anyway, we looked at the sun with our telescope yesterday. 
we'll find out in a few weeks if we damaged our vision, right? Because like immediately after you don't know, but you slowly have things swell on the retina. So in a week or two, if you have vision problems, then you'll know you looked at the sun too much. Yeah. Why didn't you tell me about the whole one, two week delay on <laughs> before I made a telescope? Was <laughs> he, there was a solar filter on it. There was no danger there. Yeah, I'm sure you're okay. <laughs> yeah. I spent the rest of the day staring at signs off. Yeah. I, I well, remember, I aimed the telescope looking at the sun with my naked eye because I got so frustrated. So, yeah, I've been... <laughs> don't blind yourself to frustrate. Okay, so back to Galileo. He studied the sun with the naked eye and a telescope. Yeah, he did damage his vision. Um, he saw sunspots. We saw sunspots in the sun yesterday and the day before. Um, he saw blemishes on the sun. That was important because Aristotle's theory was everything out there was perfect. Blemishes on the sun wouldn't be perfect. He also observed things like there are four so-called Galilean moons orbiting Jupiter. And so he, he discovered these things that suggested that the standing view of everything going around the earth was incorrect. And he said, we have to test things. Another common thing Aristotle said, Aristotle said, okay, I have this book. If I push the book, it comes to a stop. It comes to a stop because that's the right way. The book should be at rest. And so Aristotle said that we have a natural motion and that's at rest. Now, if I lift it up, it's going to fall because it has a natural position and that's as close to the ground as it can get. So I drop it, it fell because it's natural motion, it's natural position, be at rest on the ground. Anything else like me pushing it would be a violent action. I did violence on it by pushing it. And then it reaches its natural state again. Galileo said, I don't think that's right. I think that there has to be something pushing it to make it stop. So when I push it, something pushes back to make it stop. And he did lots of experiments on that to discredit the ideas of Galileo or of, of Aristotle. And so that's what the whole Lean Tower of Pisa thing is. He probably never dropped anything off of it. But the idea was Aristotle said, if I have a cannonball that's twice as massive as another, it has twice as much desire to be on the ground. So it's going to fall twice as fast. And so the time it's in the air should be half as long. And by his experiments that he did on inclined planes, Galileo said, no, no, it's going to be the same. And so he did experiments to show you know, this is incorrect and to support his theories. So that's the beginning of our scientific method. Then we have Sir Isaac Newton, who, you know, he did everything important. He invented calculus, came up with his laws of motion, universal gravitation. He was all over the place. He was a, he wrote more about religion and like Bible commentary than he did ever about science. He was a politician, although, as I understand it, he only spoke on the floor once. When he stood up to speak, everyone's like, the great man's going to say something. And he said, can we close that window? It's getting drafty in here. So probably not a very good uh, politician. Um, let's just skip over him. I got Marie Curie here who did work with radioactive isotopes, learned a lot about radioisotopes, died from the damage done by those. Um, could be worse, I believe, her husband was knocked over in a wagon, went over his head and smashed the melon. Um, one of her daughters also won a Nobel Prize. So they had three of the four people in their family won Nobel Prizes. How'd you like to be the fourth person in that family? <laughs> um, Niels Bohr, our understanding of the atom was largely um, credited to him. He came up with a quantum method of explaining the atom. Let me quickly talk about model theory and law. A model is something that is not necessarily true or accurate, but that helps us to understand how something works. So Gal or Aristotle had his model of the crystal spheres. Now, he thought it was correct. These days, we still have that model that we use. When we talk about the positions of stars, we talk about the positions on the celestial sphere which was the outermost sphere of Aristotle's model. And we can very easily identify positions of stars in the skies using that model. 
But it's not true. The stars in the sky are not all on this big sphere that's rotating around the Earth. It just made, it's a model. It's a, a figure of, that allows us to understand how things work better. So that's what a model is. A theory is an explanation to explain patterns we see in nature. We start with a hypothesis like an educated guess, and as it's tested over and over, we get more confidence, and we just start calling it a theory instead of a hypothesis. Hypothesis is an early theory kind of theory. And laws are concise, usually things that can be put in mathematical form, explanations of nature that work over a very broad range. So it's important to know what a model is compared to what a theory is. That the law, you know, the difference in the law and a theory is not super important to me. Laws, you, as you would expect, laws have more importance in the overall scheme just because they're broader in their scope. Model of an atom. Is that what goes on in an atom? What goes on in an atom? I'll give you the answer. No one knows. Quantum physics actually was invented because people were really frustrated. Nobody knows. Well, then let's forget the things that no one can know and look at what we can know. Because we don't know what electrons are doing in an atom at all. We can tell you where they're likely to be found. We can tell you what their angular momentum is and so on. But we can't tell you what path they're traveling. We can't try tell you where they're going to be located at any special time. Um, the, the method for scientific learning. Yes, you do have to read previous things first, right? You're starting here for physics, learning some things about physics. And then later on, you might move forward into more cool things there. You go through the observation, hypotheses, and testing, all like I talked about yesterday. So here's the scientific method I outlined yesterday. I outlined it yesterday. I do not need to waste more time on that. And this very important question, when is the scientific method done? Never. Now, at some point, you do publish, right? You don't say, I'm not going to publish because I haven't proven anything. Because, of course, nothing is ever proven in science. But when you've done enough experimentation that you think you've got something, you publish it. The scientific process is supposed to be, it's not always followed, it's supposed to be that you write up a paper, you send it out for peer review, they send it to a couple people who read it over and say, this makes sense, or, ooh, he's got a mistake here. They publish it, then everybody else jumps on your back and tries to find flaws in what you did, and they try to reproduce your experiments. That's the way it's supposed to work. Every now and then you have scientists who, like, are so sure that they found something earthbreaking, they go straight to the press with it. And half the time, at least, they end up embarrassing themselves and scientists. Like when I was in graduate school and Fleischmann and Pons announced that they had discovered cold fusion in their lab. Cold fusion is fusion of, in this case, hydrogen to helium, releasing huge amounts of energy in a situation that did not require enormous amounts of energy to make it happen. That's what the cold part of cold fusion is. You don't have to put in a lot of energy to make it happen. If that occurs, if we can manage cold fusion, our energy crisis is over. We just put these little cold fusion units in our cars, and our car is good for its lifetime. You never have to put in gas or any, you know. Same thing for your house. You have an, in, not infinite, but a, a lifetime supply of energy for your lights and stuff, which is a little unit. So they went straight to the press. You know, we've got it. Boo, boo, you know, we're the greatest scientists ever. And then people tried to reproduce it. And no one has ever reproduced it. If they'd gone through the proper process, there would have been no big hoopla and no embarrassment. This is the last slide of the lecture portion, the difference in accuracy and precision. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the difference in accuracy and precision because it's not actually part of the lab. Accuracy is a measurement of how close to correct an answer is. So you make a measurement. If it's accurate, it's going to be reasonably close to correct. Precise is how reproducible it is. So here we have the cluster. Those four are all very close to each other, very reproducible. So very precise, but not accurate because you can totally see the red dot. The goal is to get it here in the middle. Over here, this is accurate, but not 
precise. That is the average position is here in the middle, but they're spread out. When you're making measurements, you want to be both accurate and precise. Accuracy, if you use the instrument wrong, it'll be inaccurate, right? If you use it wrong in a very consistent fashion, you can be very precise but inaccurate. And so as you're going through your measurements, you want to try to account for how accurate you are, that is how far off could you be from the right value, and also think about precision. Okay, let's take a break. And